Um, one of the questions was when we sent this out, did did regionally was there did did organizations uh, respond in the rates that they were represented in the initial data set? And generally, the answer is yes. So, in other words. Um, the blue the blue column is when you look at Africa, 12% of our original data set was made up of African NGOs or NGOs that were based in Africa, and of the total response, slightly less, 9% responded. So it's not as if we sent it out and we only got a tiny response rate from certain regions. It was it was fairly it was fairly even there. I was mentioning before the education of the respondents, and this was something important for us to look at in thinking about what attitudes might be toward refugees, and we see that pretty well-educated respondents here. So college or university uh, educated 60%, and then another 36% had one or more years of co college or university. So we're talking about a fairly well-educated group of people. Um, we also were interested in what kind of services were provided by these NGOs around the world. Again, we're talking about refugee organizations, and they're doing different things within their organizations to help, re help refugees. So a lot were doing social services, law and advocacy, education, and health, and then other things along the way. But you know, it, it runs the gamut of, type, of types of services that they were providing. Um, then we began to look at, in our questions, who were they serving? And we wanted to analyze the whole range of refugees that they provided protection to. So when you look at the top of the, the slide, you see gender identity. The blue, when we asked them, did you serve anyone who was fleeing persecution based on gender identity in the last year? Only about 30% of them responded. This is all the respondents from anywhere in the world. Another block said no, and another block really had no idea. So the, the folks that said no idea, it could be that they were providing services to refugees where the claim ground didn't come out, so they might be you know, doing education or housing assistance, so they wouldn't know. You're a refugee, we're helping you out, we don't know what your claim ground is. But you see there that gender identity, the yes on gender identity is quite low, as is sexual orientation when compared to the bottom graph, which is this political opinion, which people know, often know more about. Um, the other thing that we were interested in, in learning was like, how does that get dispersed in, in regionally? Who's responding in what way from which countries around the world? And the interesting responses, like when we look at, um, for instance, the big bar there, it says uh, for the Middle East, you see that 86% of the respondents from the Middle East said that they had served um, somebody who was fleeing persecution. Uh, of those who had served somebody, 86% um, said that they had served somebody on the basis of gender identity. So there's an interesting dispersal, but I should note that there's small numbers. So if you look down at the bottom, actually the number of respondents that we got from this region was only 12. So I don't want to put too much weight on what these kind of graphs look like. Um, because we're, we're talking about specific, um, fairly small numbers. Um, one of the things that we were also interested in was ethical guidelines or codes of conduct. That's often reflective of attitudes about uh, cat protected categories of individuals. So we wanted to know, A, do you have a code of conduct or do you have ethical guidelines that are in the workplace? And if you do, do they include uh, sexual orientation or gender identity? So this, so this picture is just of those organizations that do have those guidelines, we wanted to know whether they included gender identity or sexual orientation as a protected category. And then this, this one shows how that's distributed. So if you look at the, the Africa bar on the left, 55% um, of those organizations that are based in Africa that have ethical guidelines or codes of conduct include sexual <coughs> orientation or gender identity. 92% North America and Europe. And that actually represents a much larger group of organizations as well because they're, if you look down at the bottom, it's 134 respondents of the total. So take that as you will. Um, again, like I said in the beginning, we were curious about religion. Does it play a role in your work? And if it does, does that have any impact on your willingness to protect LGBTI refugees. 
there are some interesting, you know, interesting responses here. But like I said, when we did the comparison to the willingness, it made no difference. You know, and I and I think that that's valuable because it really does help us think about who is out there, uh, who are our allies, and who's doing the work um, in it in an egalitarian way in protecting LGBT refugees. Um, Another thing that we wanted to basically understand was attitudes about sexual orientation and gender identity. So take it out of the refugee context. Let's not talk about whether you're providing services or not or how you're doing it. What are your general attitudes and opinions um, about sexual orientation and gender identity? So we asked an, a series of questions, and these are sort of the, the, the central ones that we wanted to learn about. Um, the, the top question is about gender identity. What is your opinion about somebody who is born with one sex and presents as another gender or sex? And the blue there is, is it's, quite, it's quite long, and it says they don't believe that it's wrong at all. So that's, you know, it's close to 70%, um, and that's quite a large number. It's pretty similar for the second question, which is about um, opinion about sexual relations between two consenting adults. The one thing to note there is when you look at the purple, that it, the response rate there is always wrong. And so you see that for sexual orientation there tended to be a greater response rate saying that's always wrong than gender identity issues, which is something for us to think about. Um, we also wanted to know about the one's expression of sexual orientation or gender identity and whether whether Eddie was talking about this issue about discretion and whether you you're meant to hide your sexual orientation to 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 survive in your country of origin so we were interested in attitudes about that so again um, we asked questions that had to do with the various categories so the first one at the top there is um, transgender individuals born male should present themselves as males to avoid persecution. <coughs> and, you know, the, 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 the blue and the red you could read together because they're strongly disagree and disagree. Quite high, close to 80%. <coughs> Same is true for lesbians and homosexual men. So the attitudes generally were, no, you don't have to hide to avoid persecution. Interestingly, there was even a higher um, supportive answer for bisexuals. You don't have to be in a heterosexual relationship to, to, to protect yourself from persecution. Um, question about intersex was kind of more all over the place. And that may reflect the fact that people don't know what intersex is. Um, and so the question there had to do with whether one should have to, to you know, choose one sex or another. And, and there was less of a response rate that um, reflected that people understood the issues there.